we can start. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Luigi Scattieri. I'm a research fellow at the Center for European Reform. And welcome uh, to this webinar organized by the CER together with the uh, BPAG, the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group. Our topic today is uh, European policy towards uh, the Western Balkans. So uh, over the last two decades, really, the EU has, has tried to integrate countries in the region more closely, both in economic terms and in, and in political terms through the accession process. And we used to actually all, I think, think of enlargement as the biggest success of uh, European foreign policy, but that's, uh, that's now changed. Um, Serbia and Montenegro started negotiations uh, relatively early in the, in the 2010s, and uh, they, they have stalled. Uh, Albania and North Macedonia have met the criteria to start talks, but uh, European leaders haven't yet agreed on doing so uh, because of Bulgaria's veto. Kosovo isn't recognized as a state by five EU members and remains very far from being able to start accession negotiations. And Bosnia, uh, I think we've all been following the news uh, coming out of there recently. It doesn't seem to be in a good shape at all with uh, Serb leader Milorad Dodik taking, uh, threatening to succeed and taking some steps in that direction. And of course, all of this at a time when uh, reform efforts have uh, faltered and there has been a substantial degree of democratic backsliding while the influence of non-European actors in the region has grown. And I know that the Balkans in Europe uh, Policy Advisory Group has just written a brief on this, the contents of which they'll be uh, discussing today. So to better understand all these developments and what they mean for European uh, policy in the Western Balkans, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our four excellent uh, speakers today. We have Florian Bieber, who's Professor of History and Politics at the University of Graz and coordinator of uh, BPAG. Robert Cooper, former British and European diplomat who worked closely with both Xavier Solana and Catherine Ashton and uh, knows the Balkans very well. Milica Delevic, who works for uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, but is speaking today uh, in her personal capacity as a BPAG member and Nikolaos Tsifakis, Associate Professor at the University of Peloponnese and also a member of BPAC. So thank you all very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, the way this will work is that each speaker is going to have around 10 minutes uh, to, uh, to speak and then we're going to have a, a broader discussion. It's an on the record discussion and indeed we are being uh, recorded right now. So. That's enough uh, for me. Uh, we're going to, as agreed, uh, begin from uh, Florian, who uh, will uh, give us his, his assessment of the state of European uh, policy uh, towards the region. Over to you, Florian. Thank you very much, Luigi. And I'll give you just a brief sense of the background against which the study was written. Um, and uh, Nikos and Milice will tell you more about the substance of, of this particular su uh, study. It's part of a, a study is written on the basis of opinion polls we've conducted last year, as well as this year uh, throughout the Western Balkans. Uh, and this year in particular, we were interested in the perceptions of uh, external actors, non-Western actors uh, in the Western Balkans. Now, the Balkans and Euro Policy Advisory Group has been working on issues of EU integration for years, as well as that of other external actors. And uh, when we began our work eight years ago, one of our first uh, studies developed scenarios for the Western Balkans. And one of them we call the Turkish scenario, which is a scenario where basically formally there's an enlargement process ongoing, but nobody's really believing in it anymore. And it's not really moving in any particular uh, tangible direction. And uh, instead, the country is looking for other allies um, around the world. And I think, you know, unfortunately, this was not our, our ideal scenario, but we've kind of moved a, a lot closer to that particular type of trajectory for the region. So you could say that um, the European accession process is in profound crisis. And Luigi already outlined the key aspects of that. And I think this is the background against which any role of external actors comes into play. Without that crisis, I think we wouldn't see such a sustained and also destructive presence of some of the external actors and also their gross overestimation by citizens uh, across the region um, to some extent. So um, we published uh, earlier 
last month, um, uh, another policy brief on the crisis of enlargement. And there we have some numbers where you can see that, well, overall in the region, people still are quite enthusiastic about joining the European Union. So it's not that they see any alternative uh, for the most part, but what is, so except for Serbia, the number is in the 80 and 90 percentile uh, of people who support joining the European Union, but there are some worrying signs. First of all, younger people are more skeptical than the older, so there's kind of a decline in support generationally, but also people more and more don't believe it will ever happen. And I think this is the biggest problem. People might like to join the European Union, but you know it's kind of like wishing for winning the lottery, but they don't actually believe it's going to happen. Um, so you might still buy the lottery ticket uh, because it might you know, happen one day, but it's not something you're planning your future on. And this is really what we're seeing is that the number of citizens who don't believe it will happen or will believe it will happen in 20 years, so kind of really in a long perspective, um, is increasing. And that means that the EU is, is no longer the kind of seen as the transformative mechanism across the region. And this is, I think, really the, the, the starting premise which we're talking about. So it doesn't mean that across the region other actors are fundamentally popular. Um, and I think one thing we do see in our study quite uh, strongly is that also the European Union is, is the view of the European Union is, is very different in Serbia from the rest of the region. So Serbia is becoming an outlier in many way, ways, but this is a particular result of the nature of the, the government there, which has moved more and more towards an authoritarian direction. Uh, but that is not um, without repercussions um, in the region. So well, and uh, both Milica and Nikos will speak more to that in, in, our, in, in our brief does as well, which you can find, by the way, in our website, which is bpag.eu, so B-I-E-B-P-A-G.eu, um, where it's not just about EU or, or West versus rest. I mean, first of all, different external actors have to be seen on their own merits and they act quite differently with different interests in mind and, and different, different priorities. Um, but it's also that the EU is not hewn out of one stone, and there are different actors in the European Union which are perceived differently by citizens. So citizens, uh, you know, might not, uh, you know, when they say they're pro-European, does it mean they're pro-EU in the way we think of uh, the European Union, or are they pro-Orban EU? Um, so I think we have to be kind of careful that we don't see it as a dichotomy EU versus rest, but rather look more critically at what are citizens supporting within the European Union, but also seeing that Serbia has been gaining, as we'll hear, a role within the region, mostly through vaccine diplomacy, which means it's become an actor of its own right. And there's this kind of dual strategy of Serbia and once at acting um, <clears throat> in alliance with uh, pro-Serbian or Serbian political parties in neighboring countries, which sometimes is known as this term Srpski Svet, so the Serbian world. And on the other side, there's this kind of claim of Serbia of regional leadership, which is transnational, but which again has repercussions. And there again, the anti-EU pro-other actor attitudes have a risk of spilling over across the region. And I think this is one thing to look at. So it's kind of moving beyond this kind of classical view of seeing Russia, China versus the EU, but seeing how, how this becomes in a certain way more, uh, more complicated as we have also key EU countries um, like uh, Hungary, which has become much closer allied to Russia in some aspects than with mainstream European Union policy. So, the problem, all of that is, is, again, the attitudes of citizens is based on their, you know, unfortunately, realistic perception that the EU enlargement process is in a crisis. So this is not just a misunderstanding, but it is, of course, <clears throat> a statement of fact. Um, the process has become unpredictable due to the vetoes, um, first by France, um, then by Bulgaria. There's no sign uh, that the Bulgarian veto will be lifted anytime soon, and even if it were, uh, there's a high plausibility that other EU member states might follow suit, encouraged by Bulgaria's uh, and France's measure. So there's nearly an endless possibility of future vetoes, which means the enlargement process is no longer merit-based. Um, the Commission might insist on it and might desire it, but it's not merit-based anymore due to the individual vetoes, which have become more prominent than they were in the past. The merit-based nature of the process is also undermined by the Commission itself, by the, by the very fact that the Commissioner in charge of enlargement 
himself as a close ally of Viktor Orban. So there's a, a reasonable doubt about his impartiality and the, the way he's doing his job um, as a commissioner. Um, and all of that, again, undermines, especially in skeptical countries towards enlargement, whether or not this is really um, a merit-based process anymore. Um, and then, of course, there are there has been no movement in Serbia or Montenegro, the two so-called front runners, for different reasons. Um, there's no ability at the moment of the European Union to really have the leverage to resolve the open conflicts in the region. So as a result, I think what we're seeing is that the current process, while formally still existing, is no longer able to both transform the societies to become more democratic or to resolve the open disputes in the region. And the EU has not been able to develop a, a strong, robust alternative foreign policy in the region to resolve those questions. So the result is that really we're, we're talking about a, a stagnation without a clear answer. And, and it is in that environment that foreign actors, non-European actors have uh, gathered in strength. And in fact, gathered in strength often at a very low price. Uh, and uh, it is really this, this challenge which we have to face and which we have to understand that it provides uh, uh, multiple risks for uh, the European Union, a, a prestige and reputational uh, cost, um, a loss of influence, uh, and also it uh, allows other actors to, in a certain way, show the weakness of the European Union. And also um, it divides the European Union, as we see with uh, not just en enlargement supporters and critics, but what I call sometimes the false friends of enlargement, namely uh, the governments uh, such as the current Hungarian government, which is supporting enlargement, but mostly because it wants to have more Orbans in the European Union and thereby actually undermining the very message of the European integration. All of this creates a much more uh, fluid picture uh, and one where we can't say that it's just about strengthening the enlargement process, but it's about really uh, reinvigorating the European Union and its ability uh, together with its allies uh, you know, which uh, I would imagine to be also Great Britain and the United States in addressing um, the more malign influence of other actors uh, in the Western Balkans. I'll leave it here and um, my colleagues will then tell you a little bit more about the specific study. Thank you. Thank you very much, Florian. And I'm sure we'll, we'll go a bit deeper into what an alternative, robust European and indeed Western foreign policy towards the region might look like. But let me turn now to uh, Nikolaus, I think. We agreed you would be next to, to discuss the role of foreign actors in a bit more detail. Uh, thank you, Luigi. Thanks for this uh, opportunity uh, to present our work. Uh, as Florian said, this is a, a large survey that uh, we are presenting it in parts. The first part was presented a few weeks ago was about uh, the, how, how popular is EU enlargement in the region. This is the second part on the role of external actors. And there is a third part uh, coming out in a few days on uh, trust uh, in the institutions in the region. Uh, so uh, if, we, if we see perceptions, I focused on the first two parts and the military can continue with the third part of, of uh, the survey. Uh, we see that the EU is acknowledged as a major economic partner in terms of trade and investment. It is, um, the EU and its members are considered uh, region-wide to be the largest partner by 47% of Western Balkan citizens. The EU also is, uh, and its members uh, are perceived to represent the greatest donor of assistance to the region, which uh, again by 42% of respondents. But then the, um, the data that we have uh, become much more puzzling when we enter to the pandemic. And there we see, for instance, that there is much dis dissatisfaction with the way Brussels has performed during the pandemic, uh, where the respondents of North Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina believe that Serbia provided greater pandemic-related aid uh, than the EU and its member states combined. Uh, so Serbia has succeeded by quickly moving to, to these countries and uh, with symbolic gestures of donations of vaccines to make a greater impression, a better, to, to achieve a, a greater impact than um, the EU with a substantially uh, larger assistance. Uh, the, the EU image in the region overall is tarnished. There are, um, there is a question that we, we, we ask respondents to rate the average influence of external actors in a scale from one to 10, where one is minimum, marginal, and 10 is maximum. And we see that the EU is not very highly assessed overall, and it comes as the most influential, the most positively appreciated external actor only in Montenegro. 
Uh, on the other hand, Russia, uh, the Poles of Russia in Serbia, or of the United States in Albania and Kosovo, even Turkey in North Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, are much more positively perceived than the corresponding policies of the EU, of the EU in these countries. We also pose the same question uh, in terms of leaders. We ask again the respondents to rank leaders for, in, a, in a scale from, from one to 10, where one is the minimum and 10 is the highest appreciation. And we gave 10 names of the most uh, known uh, in the region world and regional leaders. And we're seeing that uh, uh, the last one uh, in this, uh, in terms of appreciation, is the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, who has received uh, on average 13.5% of very positive use in, in the region. So she's coming as the least appreciated uh, leader uh, in, uh, of, of those four, of the most uh, known uh, foreign world and regional leaders uh, that we ask respondents to give their view. Uh, this, uh, this trend uh, that is uh, quite negative is also replicated on a question uh, with, uh, with respect to fake news. Uh, the EU is uh, in, all Western, in all Western Balkan countries, with the exception of Albania, the EU and its member states are considered as greater propagators of fake news than Russia. And in North Macedonia, Kosovo, and Serbia, the union is perceived to disseminate more disinformation than China as well. So this is a, a blow to the credibility of the EU if we think if uh, in all the countries but Albania, uh, they consider that the uh, information coming from Russia or China is more reliable uh, than the EU and its, and its member states. And this, uh, this view that I'm showing you now and Florian also explained earlier, is much more worrying if we focus on Serbia. All these trends are looking even worse in the case of Serbia. In a nutshell, the, the overwhelming majority of Serbian citizens are against the country's NATO membership, and they think that Serbia should rely more on Russia for its national security. The Serbian citizens also believe that China is the greatest donor, and they think that China and Russia are the countries that offer greater pandemic-related assistance than the EU during the last couple of years. They are also having greater expectations from China and Russia with respect to assistance to, uh, to attain recovery from uh, the pandemic. Uh, there was also a question about uh, vaccines and which vaccines they trust more in Serbia, in all the countries, but in Serbia again, it's the most uh, uh, interesting finding. And we see that in Serbia, the most uh, trusted uh, vaccines are Sinopharm and Sputnik. And uh, the respondents gave us first explanation for their trust on these vaccines, the country of origin of uh, these vaccines, which is Russia and China. So we see that there are very high levels of trust to these countries, uh, especially that which are hard to explain, especially if we think that uh, it concerns the two vaccines for about uh, uh, whose, whose reliability is the least uh, uh, confirmed uh, to us. Um, and uh, a last question, because it's, uh, uh, I don't know how interesting it is to give uh, survey data uh, via uh, webinar uh, and, and focus too much on numbers uh, and rankings. Is that we ask, um, we ask uh, the Serbian people, the Serbian citizens, to rank uh, leaders. And we saw the most positively perceived leader is Vladimir Putin, enjoying 62% of very positive approval rate, followed by Xi Jinping with 49%, and followed by Viktor Orban with 29%. Three Western leaders, Emmanuel Macron, Joe Biden, or Ursula von der Leyen, are the least uh, appreciated in Serbia with 15, 5, and 4% uh, high, uh, very positive approval rates in the country. So we see that uh, 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 there the are very negative perceptions in Serbia, and I'll be happy in the discussion that will follow to try to explicate these trends and, uh, and what, uh, what is the cause of this uh, uh, distinction between reality and perceptions. Thank you very much, uh, Nikolaos. But it's quite shocking that the EU is seen as the, and disheartening that the EU is seen as the main uh, propagator of fake news in the region. But anyway, without further uh, delay, Milica, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi. Uh, more hearteningly, uh, West, uh, Great Britain appears as uh, uh, where you see the UK appearing in the survey is mostly as spreading fake news. So the image of the Perfidion Albion does seem to persist uh, in the Western Balkans. I will be uh, speaking about the perceptions also, like Nikos, not the reality, because the perception 
in the Western Balkans are not always related to the re reality and they are very resilient. And I think there has been recently a lot of talk about geopolitics in the Western Balkans, but we were still quite surprised when we saw the results of the survey. And I would say the two main findings of the results uh, of the survey was First, the extent to which uh, there is the EU has lost the PR battle uh, in terms of reality and the perception being completely divorced uh, in the Western Balkans. And the second is the extent to which uh, it has lost soft power in the Balkans, because I think you can keep repeating to the people and all of us who are based here in the UK know this. You can keep repeating that EU is the biggest uh, trading partner, the biggest investor, uh, the place where your students uh, go for years abroad. If there is no place in heart for the European Union, it's extremely hard to persuade people that this is the direction uh, where you need to go. What I think it's really damning for the European Union that this is a small region totally surrounded by the European Union with less than 20 million people. Uh, it has been promised membership in 20, 2003 and the majority of the region, although not very enthusiastically, uh, still supports uh, European membership, that the EU is not seen as the, the, that its influence is not assessed very positively and that increasingly we are seeing uh, other geopolitical actors vie for influence uh, in this very important area. One would expect that uh, if we think of the early 90s and Jacques Paul's uh, The Hour of Europe and what happened uh, following that in the former Yugoslavia, that the EU will be extremely careful uh, how uh, its strategic sovereignty might look, uh, strategic autonomy might look uh, while being unable to resolve issues like Serbia, Kosovo or progress Albania and North Macedonia's application, let alone, let alone Kosovo's visa liberalization process. But here we are, that's exactly what we are discussing. Nikos uh, outlined main numbers. I will talk uh, more about whether change is anywhere in the making in the region and where change could come from uh, would come through different political parties or different political options coming in power in any of the regional countries or new generations coming of age uh, and uh, uh, maturing uh, and uh, wishing for a change of geopolitical orientation uh, of their countries. I would think that um, electoral change is unlikely to change uh, geopolitical orientation in, in majority of our countries, which is to say that these geopolitical orientations are fairly settled. I would however think that people are no longer extremely passionate about this. Uh, they consider that this is, as Florian mentioned in the beginning, this is the something that has no alternative. They will continue saying that they want to join the European Union, but don't, you don't see uh, nearly the level of passion that you saw uh, in the beginning of uh, 2000s or during the war in the 90s where people uh, hoped uh, I am... Okay, um, I will suggest that you might want to turn yes, off your camera. Yes, yes, that's what I, I hope that this will make it uh, better. So uh, yeah. the geopolitical geopolitical orientation in majority of the Western Balkan countries, I believe is settled, although nearly, uh, not nearly as passionate as it was uh, during the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, so the influence and the affinity towards third actors transcends the preferences of political actors currently in place in regional countries. Uh, one caveat, which I think it's worth pointing out, is that, and unsurprising, that kinship ties matter, uh, with voters of ethnic parties feeling stronger affinity towards national countries like uh, Turkey being perceived as important actor in North Macedonia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and in addition, what we established is that strongmen like strongmen and that the appeal obviously of strongmen transcends national borders and kinship ties. So the leaders of Turkey and Hungary appear to wield influence beyond national and cultural links and their cult leadership style 
uh, translates into positive approval ratings by voters of parties whose leaders are of similar disposition. For example, Orban against the ruling party voters in Serbia or main opposition uh, voting partners in uh, par uh, parties in Macedonia. What uh, there are three somewhat interesting countries, Serbia, North Macedonia and Montenegro, where potentially uh, electoral change uh, might mean change of geo might affect not change, but influence uh, geopolitical orientation in Serbia. The voters of the main opposition party, and it's extremely difficult in Serbia to decide what voters of opposition parties think because they are very splintered. So we worked on the basis of data that is available, and I'm not saying that it's totally representative, but at least with regard to the main opposition party, which was captured by the survey, we can still say that uh, uh, its voters are still more pro-European than those of the main uh, two government parties. But where we see the difference is in level of support for Russia and in particular for China. And I would say that the new line, this is the new line of polarization. You don't see a lot of passion and a lot of polarization of the EU uh, when it comes to the EU, but you see a lot of difference when it comes to, in particular, China. Voters of pro-government parties are very strongly pro-China oriented. Uh, they are also more supportive of both Russia and China than they are of the European Union. And they very feel very strongly about Turkey and the Gulf countries. And I would also say here that this is closeness to autocrats more than the nationality factor. Main opposition part, main uh, opposition party voters supports the European Union the most. Russia relatively close second, but China comes distant fourth. Additionally, support for the EU among pro-government voters is likely to have been boosted by the positive view of Orban. And this is what uh, Florian mentioned in the beginning. You can't really decipher the extent to which they like the European Union from the extent to which they like Orban, who represents the European Union. And it's small wonder that in Serbia, uh, um, they perceive Hungary as the most supportive country on the, uh, their uh, Serbia's European integration. European integration path. A change of orientation and a negative one could in Serbia then happen, come rather from uh, governing parties, uh, parties in power deciding to pursue their rhetoric, which is very much pro China and pro Russia, rather than the opposition coming to power. Should the opposition come to power, I would expect expect uh, Serbia's difficult journey towards the European Union uh, to continue. And this is one of the countries where former Yugoslavia non-aligned legacy has, can probably be felt the most, and I think we shouldn't discount it. In, more, in North Macedonia, it's much more clear-cut case. And there, the, mo uh, the voters of the main opposition party, the MRO, are primarily pro-Russia and have weaker pro-EU and very weak pro-US attitudes. Their preferred leader is Vladimir Putin and their second choice is uh, Viktor Orban. So if we see a change of uh, government in North Macedonia, this might put in danger the current understanding of the kind of European perspective that the country, that the country should follow. And the really most enigmatic one is uh, probably Montenegro, uh, where we have uh, a new government in place uh, composed of different parties. Uh, the voters of the DPS, the former uh, backbone of the government, are still the most pro-European. But the new government, as I said, is composed of different parties and their voters have different attitudes uh, towards different geopolitical actors. However, what we've observed during the, uh, this government being in power is that the support for NATO increased during the last year and membership is ultimately approved by more than 50% of Montenegro citizens, which I'm taking as a sign that this also is becoming settled when it comes to uh, Montenegro's geopolitical orientation. Finally, what I'd like to mention is uh, differences in terms of generation, education, and occupation. And again, uh, I think both Mikos and Florian alluded to this previously, is that uh, um, these are not dramatic, and I don't see new generations coming that are going to totally reverse 
uh, uh, geopolitical direction of their countries. But they're not going to be passionate about European integration the way that uh, generations that were maturing during the war and immediately afterwards. And it is really true that we see the generation of 30 to 44 being the most supportive of the European Union and the most supportive of the West, if we can still define uh, such a term. Uh, older voters are mostly pro-Russian uh, in Serbia and uh, countries that tend to be affected by uh, Serbia. Uh, in Albania and Kosovo, you have a stronger affiliation towards uh, the US. Uh, across the region, uh, younger voters are more aware of China as an important economic and foreign policy actor, but are also more wary about it. And they are particularly wary about China in the context of environment. So uh, if you were to talk about new generations and what they are bringing on board, it's definitely a greater awareness of China, but not uh, as necessarily, uh, not necessarily as a positive actor. Uh, so indeed the region uh, presents, uh, uh, it's quite damning assessment of the European Union to see a region so small, so encircled by the European Union and yet where the European Union is the main trading partner, the main investment partner, the main migration destination, the main travel destination, and yet where the perception of EU influence uh, is either so devoid of any passion or uh, reversing as we are seeing uh, in Russia. And with this, I uh, probably time for Robert uh, to uh, provide us with an external perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Melitza. Very, very interesting. Uh, Robert, uh, over to you. Yes, I suppose the question is, what do you make of it? And in general, what's your assessment of, uh, of European foreign policy, including, of course, British foreign policy? I, I always include Britain when I speak of European and not EU. Uh, yeah, over to you. Well, <clears throat> um, I wouldn't assume that Britain has a policy, so I won't talk about that. Um, I, we've all talked about um, opinion polls so far. Um, I think it would be more interesting to talk about policy. Uh, I don't know many places where opinion polls are based entirely, where policy is based entirely on opinion polls. Uh, I don't think we'd be a better place, better world if it was. Um, uh, if you come back to the beginning um, and ask, uh, I think probably it was uh, Florian who said at the beginning that um, enlargement was seen as the most successful European policy. Um, uh, for my part, I still see it as the most successful European policy. Actually, I think it's almost the only successful European policy. Um, it's the only thing that the EU has done that has actually made a difference to the way the world looks. I recall but this is now going back more than 10 years. I recall going, saying to one American interlocutor a little while after they'd gone into Iraq, um, actually, we're the people who do regime change, um, uh, talking about Europe. And if you look at uh, Central and Eastern Europe, while it's by no means perfect, uh, that's been the story. Look at the Baltic states, for example, where there are actually some success stories here. And on the whole, Central and Europe, Central and Eastern Europe could do, could do better, uh, but they could have done quite a lot worse too. So I don't see what's wrong with enlargement as a policy. It's the only way in which I don't believe in um, that Europe is going to become a great power in the old fashioned military sense. Um, uh, uh, so the question is really one for the members of the European Union to make their minds up about. Do they want to do something or do they just want to pretend? If they want to do something, then there's one thing they can do and it's right there on their doorstep. Uh, and this is the place uh, which actually created European foreign policy in a serious way. All of the European institutions around foreign policy were created as a result of the Balkan Wars. The high representative arrived because of the Balkan Wars. The EU military staff was sized um, on the basis of how could we create an organization big enough 
to put a peacekeeping force into Bosnia. Basically, that was the question that they asked when they were doing this. So the EU's got a choice, um, and I don't know what which way it's going to uh, which way it's going to go. Um, uh, so far, um, I think they've made a series of bad choices, um, and the real question is whether they can change their minds or not. But um, uh, uh, here is something which can be done. Um, as opposed to a whole lot of other things. Um, can anybody else suggest a strategic role for the EU apart from this? Um, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen speaks about the EU as a, becoming a, a geopolitical actor. Um, well, if that's what it wants to, um, here's an opportunity. Um, now, I mean, if uh, do you want to know where to start in the Balkans? Um, there's a, there are, whole series of problems there, which some of which I don't think I would try to solve. Um, uh, but maybe there are even opportunities as well. Others probably know what's going on in the region better than, uh, than I do. Um, uh, I'm a bit struck by the fact that um, we've had a democratic transition in Kosovo. Um, maybe even a significant democratic transition because it's a transition from um, people who uh, who made their name um, uh, as uh, who made their name in the war uh, to a new generation, um, and it's actually been this is uh, this was a highly democratic process, um, uh, and uh, uh, the people in Vetivendose, although it's a rather unusual party in Balkan terms, uh, are actually some of them are quite interesting people. Um, so maybe there are opportunities that somebody could. Uh, um, uh, could uh, have a look at doing something with, um, or we could all look at the opinion polls and agree that um, um, we should do what the people think we ought to do. If they want to go to China, well, then they can go to China. But if the EU wants to do something, uh, then here's an opportunity. If not, then give me another suggestion for how the EU might become a geopolitical actor. Thank you, uh, Robert, and thank you all uh, very much for, for your thoughts. Um, so I'll open up the discussion. If there's, uh, you know, people can ask questions through the usual means, whether that's putting up their hand or uh, writing a question in the chat. But I can um, start off with, uh, with one while, uh, while people think. And that is that basically, there, um, do we need to rethink accession or do we actually need to um, think of something else? And by that, what I mean, I, I think it's worth perhaps bringing in that the Commission has tried to do quite a bit of thinking on how the accession process can be uh, reformed. Um, coming up with a revised methodology last year and much of it is, is perhaps unremarkable or, or not of huge uh, uh, at least in my view, uh, not of huge impact, such as the dividing of, uh, of accession chapters into clusters and trying to involve member states a bit more. But there is one aspect that I thought could be uh, pretty interesting, which was that of um, integrating countries more closely into the single market prior to accession. Now, it's not completely new, but I think the Commission would envisage this being brought to a new level. It talks of phasing in. Um, and they say that, for example, if a country has fully implemented the key in a certain area, then um, there should be something concrete happening. So, for example, if they adopt rules relating to uh, data protection, then there might be a data adequacy decision and for, for a very concrete outcome. So I just wonder, you know, part of, uh, yes, for your thoughts on whether this is an approach that is promising or whether we need to think of something completely different, whether that is, um, I, I don't know, but you know, there have been a lot of proposals put forward like uh, even uh, uh, Western Balkans, EEA and, uh, uh, and other similar proposals. But anyway, so let me turn uh, first to uh, Dennis McShane. Dennis, please go ahead. Hello, Hello Thank you very much, absolutely. 
fascinating. I've been pondering with all these problems ever since being Europe minister, writing a book on Kosovo about 10 years ago, traveling there an awful lot. I can't share Robert Cooper's confidence. Imagine 20 years after 1945, Germany and France hadn't recognized each other. There was a state of no war, but absolutely no peace. Uh, Europe would have been seen as the most monumental fa failure imaginable. Who could put pressure on it? I don't know. There's never been consistent, solid pressure by uh, Mrs. Merkel and then any of her big cheese associates. Britain took an interest. Boris Johnson told me two or three years ago, his foreign minister, keep writing on Kosovo, Dennis. Yes, yes, we're all very keen on that. But Britain does nothing. Britain, for example, could just offer visa-free travel to the UK. An awful lot of Kosovans here, some of our best footballers are Kosovans, and they go back, uh, and that would just be a signal. I like very much the idea of an EEA consideration of some integration into the single market. The Poles have let in two million Ukrainians to work in Poland, legally or illegally. So <laughs> this people movement is still going on, despite Brexit or other worries. Macron Great disappointment, but understandable with the turn to the dark side in France. We're seeing it with, with Zemmour, we're seeing it with Marine Le Pen, we'll see what Pécresse does. We saw how our dear friend Michel Barnier suddenly started going against the European Court of Justice and so forth. So right now, you're not going to sell particularly to France the idea of two or two and a half majority Muslim nations entering Europe. Sorry. I was with the Spanish foreign minister, just a place on record, but I, I hope on Chatham House rules last week, Bill Bow. Spain wants to ease up its policy towards Kosovo. He didn't spell out how, it's been discussed. I was with him as Europe minister and the prime minister's European advisor. I urged, of course, recognition. Somebody has to cut that Gordian knot. Romania won't, Slovakia won't, Greece could. I don't understand why it won't. It will really go down well in Washington. Spain could. There's absolutely no reason why Spain can't re recognise Kosovo. That doesn't have any impact on the Catalan debate, let alone the Basque independence debate where I was last week. So we just have to keep arguing, pushing and pushing. But sadly, the hour of Europe did not sound, as Mr. Poo said in 1992. The interventions to stop the fighting were brave. But then I don't know why, why Europe, and I was there, you know, I was there, why we fell asleep at the wheel and the Balkans now, this rotting miasma of unhappy, unsettled people in a tiny backyard of Europe, which frankly should be brought into the European Union. End of uh, sermon. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, yes, I think the Spain, the Spain is uh, quite publicly, um, you know, saying that it aims to tighten up relations with uh, with Kosovo. Um, I'll turn now to Daniel Server from. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, and thank you for these fascinating presentations. Um, I want first to associate myself with Dennis McShane's uh, view that recognition uh, of Kosovo would be a major. Uh, development in the Balkans and have major impacts, uh, most of them, I think, positive. Uh, and even one or two countries recognizing uh, could have some very positive impacts. Uh, but I want to also turn attention to these rather smaller issues that I think have loomed very large in undermining uh, confidence in the Balkans in, uh, in Europe. One, of course, is the visa waiver issue for Kosovo. And I wonder if anybody who would like to try to explain uh, a way to resolve that problem. Not so much the impact of it, but how do we, how do you, uh, not we, go about uh, uh, making sure that the visa waiver is open to uh, Kosovo. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, you know, the immediate problems, I would say, are Dodik on the one hand and implementation of Jakub Finci, uh, of, uh, Finci Sedi, the Finci Sedic decision, as well as other court decisions. How does Europe get this done? How does it get 
Dodik out of the way, and how does he get the uh, European court decisions implemented? And then uh, a third big issue right now in the Balkans is the uh, eastward drift of Serbia that all of you have talked about. So what, what's to be done about that? Uh, where, where, uh, where can Europe, how can Europe fix that? Thank you very much. Uh, so for the final question of this round, uh, before I turn back to the panel, uh, Ian Bond, uh, my colleague. Thanks very much, Luigi. Um, God, that was a depressing set of presentations. Um, I'm sorry to say, I mean, very realistic, but um, not much cheer there. Um, I mean, I very much agree with Robert that it would be nice to concentrate on policy and not on opinion polls. But um, as the UK showed, if you can't get the opinion polls right, um, then the policy is going to be thrown a very long way off course. So, uh, I mean, the question that, that I have, perhaps first to, to Robert, but others may have answers as well, is what do you do to turn around the opinion polls? Because as things stand at the moment, uh, it, it sounds as though you know, the, there's a risk of a vicious spiral in which there is less support on the EU side for letting Western Balkan countries in and less support in the Western Balkans for being let in. Um, and, you know, that doesn't seem to me to end well. So how do you actually turn the opinion polling round? Thank you very much, Ian. I'll, I'll turn back to the panel, perhaps in reverse order. So if Robert, uh, would you like to go first? Yes. Um, uh, two things. I mean, you, you turn, you change opinion polls by, by acting. Um, by not uh, by not sitting around moaning about how awful things are, but by doing something, um, and there are always opportunities if you look for them. Um, if you, um, but also, but first of all, a word about recognition. Does anybody not recognise Kosovo? Now, I'm not talking about what they do, what they write in bits of paper, and so on. I'm talking about what they actually do. Um, how many countries in Europe? Uh, believe that Kosovo is a province of Serbia, because that's what the Serb constitution says. Well, maybe Serbia does, but, I, uh, but I'm not sure that anybody else does at all. Um, uh, do the Greeks behave as though Kosovo was a part of Serbia? Um, do the Spanish refuse to do business with somebody because he's calling himself a minister of the Kosovo government? The reality is that actually everybody recognizes Kosovo. Um, and it wouldn't take much to turn the, this real reality into the sort of fictitious reality of the world that diplomats live in. Um, uh, uh, so the answer, the answer actually is um, uh, to get on with it, um, uh, to stop talking about the process of US. In, uh, I think I saw a, an EU statement the other day which said, everyone remains committed to the enlargement process. Um, uh, well, I found that rather depressing. Everybody ought to remain committed to enlargement. Um, uh, so let's have a little bit less process and a little bit more action. Um, it could be done. Uh, what it needs is for somebody to make a decision as opposed to drift. Um, uh, and uh, it can be done. That would require leadership. Um, who knows? Um, uh, if you got Macron in a second term, uh, who really wanted to do something, do something that's doable, not something which is 30 years out, um, and you have a new German government, then it could be done if they wanted to. So it's a matter of choice, that's all. It's not difficult. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, it's true that European leaders find it harder and harder to refer to enlargement. They often uh, talk of a European perspective for the region. Anyway, uh, Milica, over to you. Uh, thank you, Luigi, and you tell me if I need to switch off my video. Maybe uh, it's best okay. if you turn it off. I would agree with you. You already broke up. Okay. Uh, I agree with Ian. I mean, uh, opinion polls form the context within which policy is formed and the, the lack of support 
for enlargement is dictated very much by the opinion polls in EU member countries, which are mirror image of what we are seeing in the Western Balkans. So I think the purpose of this depressing presentation is hopefully to produce some clearer policy recommendations and what can be done about it. First, whether the accession process needs to be rethought. I think nothing sends a signal of non-acceptance as reversing, changing the rules of the game in the middle of the game and saying, well, you know, we've embarked on one process and after 20 years, let's do something else. I think if you look at this poll, and this is one, uh, there is one important piece of data in here that only in Serbia, you see people supporting, uh, you could, people expressing more stronger support for economic integration than for full membership of Serbia in the European Union, which basically tells you that soon you will have the European Union and more difficult candidate countries converging on, yes, great, let's have this economic integration without political conditionality uh, and we will all be happy, you will be happy because uh, you won't have worries with your public opinion polls and I will be happy because I don't have to uh, satisfy your political conditionality that comes with full membership. But I don't think this is where we're headed. I would rather see uh, the process as something where the conditionality is revived by uh, next step by steps being made along the process, bringing something concrete and tangible because if nobody is going to bend backwards, just to be able to say to uh, people in their countries, oh, we've opened another chapter. It doesn't mean much either in positive sense or in negative sense. It's not a strong signal of disapproval and it doesn't bring anything to people if it does happen. Therefore, re reviving this heart of the process, which was concrete impact on the lives of people, and conditionality that comes with it would be a better way, in my opinion, to go forward. Another thing is um, there has been quite some damage uh, uh, being done by the European Union being perceived as supporting undemocratic regimes. Now, obviously, the European Union is not going to be choosing leadership in the Western Balkans, but it does need to avoid being tone deaf uh, in terms of understanding what is happening in Western Balkan countries. Because currently what is happening, uh, it is becoming pretty much a mantra of the communist type where people don't feel this associating themselves with this, uh, with this discourse is in any way beneficial for them. They don't see concrete benefits in their lives and they don't see how this discourse changes the way that institutions and politicians work that changes them for the better in their country. So I would think, and that's probably partly the reason why Angela Merkel scores very low in Serbia and the whole stabilitocracy question in the West Balkans does affect it. So I would think while politic needs, politics needs to be realistic on behalf of the European Union, and it does mean working with it, it also needs to take into account what people are experiencing in those countries so as to be responsive and uh, to allow people to align for this. So what would the European Union need to do is change the way it communicates. Uh, I know, uh, and it's always making my day if I visit the Twitter account, is uh, the EU is concerned. Is the EU concerned? Very. So uh, something which is more tangible, more concrete, uh, more meaningful for ordinary people, then the EU is very concerned and uh, it would like to continue the enlargement process. So first, the way it communicates. Second, deliverable of things which have long been promised. This is, first of all, visa liberalization for Kosovo, uh, accession talks for North Macedonia and Albania. The third is creating a situation where you are responsive uh, to how people, uh, to experiences of people in the region so that they can continue being aligned uh, and seeing in you a force for the better. And uh, uh, that I think will be a, a challenge in majority, in majority of the region. And then finally, it's internal question for the European Union. It is extremely hard to project uh, an image of a normative actor 
uh, in the Western Balkans if you cannot sort out a uh, situation within the European Union. And that's something which is hardly related to opinion polls. It's the question of uh, membership of some central uh, and Eastern European countries, where if you now say, uh, uh, if you don't enlarge to the Western Balkans, uh, 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 countries that don't respect democratic norms will come to the border of the European Union, while for the European Union, the bigger concern is that they're already inside the bloc. They're not at the borders, they're inside. Right. So uh, sorting out internal issues. And that's probably best to stop here. I'm too long anyway. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, Nikolaus, over to you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, there are several small points that I would like to make. Uh, I will agree with Robert that um, we have to be careful of letting polls guide policy. But I would like to recall one thing, that uh, if people such as Alexander Vucic have uh, were the heart of the pro-EU accession, this is because societies such as the Serbian society have been very much uh, looking forward to the country's EU accession. So the, the, the desire of the societies to become members of the, EU, of, of the European Union has prompted all leaders in the countries, fr from the right to the left uh, spectrum, uh, to, em to embrace the EU access of perspective, even if it is in sometimes uh, purely procedural. procedural. Um, the second thing is I would like to say is that maybe I didn't enough elaborate on my first uh, intervention, is that uh, we are trying in this survey, where it's, it's coming in the survey out, we should highlight the role of Serbia. Serbia is emerging as a regional geopolitical actor. And I'll give some concrete examples. Serbia was the first country that, uh, uh, that made purchases of uh, Russian and Chinese vaccines and normalized their purchases in the Balkans while they were not uh, uh, inspected and approved by the EU. So Serbia was a country that donated vaccines. Uh, also, the, the regime uh, were speaking about this information from China and Russia. We know very well that the people in the Balkans do not uh, read Russian newspapers or Chinese uh, uh, websites. Much of this disinformation is reproduced by local media, which is uh, by local friendly regime media uh, in the entire region. So we have to see again the role of regime friendly media in uh, giving this uh, fake news uh, influence in the region. And I'm mentioning the centrality of the role of the, of the, of the Vucic regime in Serbia, because it certainly does not help the credibility of the EU when the president of the European Commission, which I mentioned earlier as the least popular politician leader in the region, when she, she visited recently uh, Serbia and commented uh, and praised the Vucic for his efforts during the last uh, years in reforms. So there is a, a lack of reform agenda in Serbia. And by appeasing the regime that is responsible for this uh, lack of reform, you don't improve your credibility. Uh, I'll go back to Kosovo. Uh, in many respects, the EU has fallen in a trap of its own. Uh, the whole policy of uh, the EU towards Kosovo, towards the Serbia-Kosovo, uh, uh, normalization of relations was premised that at the end there would be the EU accession of both of them. So the two sides were expected to, to, to make small steps towards normalization in order to accede to the EU. The 2018 though strategy came and reversed, uh, reversed this uh, dilemma. Before 2018, Serbia knew, comprehended that the one day, the day, one hour, 10 minutes before acceding to the EU, it would recognize Kosovo. This was part of the deal. Serbia knew that the normalization implied at the end the EU accession. With the 2018 strategy that put as a matter of urgency to resolve the Serbia-Kosovo relations, the, the priorities have been reversed. It is no longer about fundamentals. It's not, no longer about the rule of law in Serbia, but it is first of all resolving the, the Kosovo question. This had allowed the regime in Serbia, A, to stop paying attention to the rule of law reforms and pretend to resolve the Kosovo question. But as far as there is no reward, which the reward is the EU membership, Serbia does not really want to resolve the Kosovo question because this reward is linked with the membership, because the membership will come once the rule of law reforms have been implemented as well. So reversing, speaking about credibility, using enlargement as panacea for all problems, including the Bosnia uh, crisis or the, or the Serbia-Kosovo relations, and then using it inconsistently, moving from fundamentals first to as a matter of urgency normalized relations, we have sent wrong signals, we have let these lead, uh, semi-authoritarian leaders in the region to cherry pick the signals that they prefer and adjust uh, their policies to these signals. So if we want to bring back the Serbia-Kosovo relations on track, the last one should take its previous position. We have to speak first for the fundamentals, and if in Serbia we have an improved rule of law, 
can reach, uh, reach to the point that is to, mm. to talk also about Kosovo in different, uh, in different terms. The last thing about, it was mentioned earlier about the Greek policy in Kosovo. Greece is a, a very quick comment. Is the most uh, uh, friendly non-recognizer, having followed everything by recognition, recognizing uh, uh, passports, uh, car license plates, uh, opening, opening offices. Uh, yet it is not sufficient. It is less than the all but recognition is less than recognition. So this is a deficiency. But at this moment, the main um, uh, grievance that Kosovo has is not the policy of the five non-recognizers, is that other EU members are stopping for three consecutive years the visa liberalization, while Kosovo has fulfilled 110 uh, requirements. And according to the European Parliament, the European Commission is ready to move ahead and uh, get visa liberalization. I'm not trying to say there is no problem with the five non-recognizers, but there is a greater obstacle ahead of us that, have been that has been created by recognizers themselves. Of course, and it has a massive impact on the EU's credibility. Florian. Thanks. I mean, first to, to Robert's point, I mean, I would agree that, of course, uh, uh, opinion polls are not the end of, uh, end of everything. But I think what, what they tell us is also how governments in the region are shaping their publics. I mean, in Serbia, uh, pu public opinion is not just kind of a, a, an actor of, of independent opinions of citizens, but they're shaped by the propaganda they're facing every yeah. day. I mean, yeah. so in that sense, I think we have to understand that these numbers tell you something about what the regime wants to happen. Um, so, you know, Serbian government wants people to be Eurosceptics because it puts the pressure off them to do the reforms they should be doing. So there's a, there's a very clear interest. So it, it tells us a lot. It doesn't mean we should follow public opinion, but it means it helps us understand also what governments are doing um, across the region. And I think this is a particular worrying if other neighbors look up at Serbia rather than at the European Union as the main country to help them get out of the pandemic crisis in the future, which means that, you know, Serbia has not just, I mean, the kind of authoritarian dynamics within Serbia is kind of spilling over to the neighbors. And this is something which one has to stop because that really has worrying repercussions. Now, so I think what are the couple of points, and some of them have been mentioned by Milica and by, by Nikos already. I mean, first of all, it's, it's basically, in, if we take try to resolve some of the things which the EU can resolve, which is the Bulgarian veto, you know, is, is an embarrassment and needs to be addressed. And it requires willing member states and allies to put pressure on Bulgaria to drop this veto. It's very, you know, plain and simple. Dr getting visa, visa liberalization for Kosovo. And then I think I would also say shifting the attention on the non-recognizers. Um, because, again, the problem with the, with the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue is that it is premised on, on that each side wants a solution equally. In Serbia, uh, only uh, doesn't really want it. It can live with the status quo perfectly well, um, at least the current government. And so there's no incentive to resolve um, the status um, from the Serbian perspective. And this makes it very difficult. So part of it is, is fixing the things in the EU which can be fixed among member states, and which yeah. just require the political commitment of key member states, France and Germany. Hopefully the new government in Germany might be a bit more kind of less lethargic than the Merkel uh, era became, at least in the end, uh, more forceful in trying to get these things uh, off the agenda. The other thing I think which it is also is like the EU needs a more proactive foreign policy beyond enlargement, can't re rely on the kind of miracle, you know, the, the magic wand of enlargement. It doesn't mean giving up enlargement, it just means that like in resolving the situation in Bosnia, resolving the situation in between Serbia and Kosovo requires more forceful intervention. And, and you know, it requires sanctions. It requires being a bit more outspoken um, than the European Union is. So, so in a certain way, kind of developing, you know, the tools of foreign policy, which the EU is reluctant to use, but in, in any place, it, it, you know, and no, there's no place better to use them than in, the, than in the Western Balkans. So I think that this is really where one where one um, should look at for more, more productive engagement. I mean, Heather um, Grabby asked in the question, what kind of productive crisis could happen that the EU would uh, shake up or wake up? And this is what worries me, is that, of course, there, there are very few productive crises. And, you know, um, migration certainly isn't one. It's been disruptive and, 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 and kind of forcing the EU in this kind of much more isolationist a border closing dynamic, which we're seeing actually that the Balkans serve as the border guards of Europe, and that's hardly a desirable vision because also it doesn't look at rule of law and any of those. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, and within the region, I, you know, we've seen these regular crises, which then the autocrats themselves resolve 
because um, you know that's how they get currency. So those crises are in fact often serving authoritarian tendencies because they provide a raison d'être for them. Um, so I think this is this is where we have to be very careful. And to Luigi's point about you know what are the alternatives? I don't think we need alternatives to EU enlargement um, in the sense of, of you know the European Economic Area and so on, because in, in fact it admits failure where I think we shouldn't admit failure um, because it's basically exactly what what those who are who are you know who are trying to sabotage the process want to achieve, um, and it, it, it drops the rule of law conditionality. So I think there are some you know some technical solutions like the staged accession process, which the um, CEPs in Brussels has together with the Center for European Policy. And in, in Belgrade has been suggesting, but I think at the end of the day, without political will, you can have the best design process. It will not work. Like you need the political will in key EU member states, and I think one needs to convince them and say, like you know, if you want to show the EU works, it has. It's it's about it's not about enlargement. I mean, again, it's about a very small par part of Europe, but it's about showing the ability of the European Union to act outside of its borders uh, in an area where there is a commitment still there. And if it loses that, then it really becomes a rather, rather futile to act anywhere else. So I think it's rather, you know, fixing what is there, developing a EU foreign policy beyond enlargement, rather than um, trying to tinker with the process forever, because I, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical that the process I mean, it can be improved. And I think, for example, qualified majority voting would help with many of the steps, but, you know, that's going to be very hard to push through. So, you know, basically, let's just focus on, on, on getting the process restarted and having kind of other parallel engagement in the region, which are more likely to succeed. Thank you, Florian. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I'll get to in a second. In the meantime, if uh, Mary Davieski wants to ask her question. I have a question for Robert Cooper, but for anybody else who wanted to answer it. Um, how far do you think um, the UK's withdrawal from the EU has um, weakened, if you like, the, those arguing for it? Thank you very much. And uh, Heather, did you have a question aside from the one that you put in the chat? Well, I, <laughs> um, yes, I'd, I'd be glad to, to elaborate a bit on it, uh, because this is a really key thing. Uh, Robert mentioned earlier that um, the EU forum was forged around the crises in the Balkans in the 90s. And, and as he said, um, the, even the military um, sizing was based on the idea of intervention and, and definitely the political side was. Um, and it's, it's not that I would wish another crisis of that kind, because it's definitely not worth it to, to improve um, CSDP um, at the cost of, of lives and, and the, the, the horrors that, that transpired there. It's more that um, at the moment, the EU is taking steps forward in integration, particularly in foreign policy, only when there's a very concrete um, task and there is a major decision to be made with real consequences for member states. Otherwise, there is a tendency for drift um, and we're seeing that a lot, that uh, as long as an issue is simply stagnating, then they're content to leave it to stagnate. And it's only when there's a, a sense of there is a step to take, there's a decision that must be taken. Um, and in this current situation, I wonder if, um, given that the steps in the accession process are really, um, well, they're essentially in the hands of, of a, Hungar a Fidesz commissioner. Um, so that's very, very hard to use at at the moment. If there are other things that could be done, so um, I think the idea of, for example, um, getting um, some of the non-recognizers to make some progress on that, that doesn't cost very much, as various people have pointed out. It really costs them very little. Uh, it's not particularly salient in domestic politics. Um, you know, if it's been possible to get uh, North Macedonia's name sorted out and a lot of other very controversial issues sorted out, surely at this point recognition um, is more feasible. Um, so I'd be glad to know what views are on that, because that itself might be something to kind of galvanize the member states towards as a some kind of short term goal. Um, and I wonder if another kind of positive crisis would be to um, to focus on some of the regional cooperation and integration um, factors. There's been talk about this for many decades, um, the idea of a Balkans customs union and so on, and the EEA is the kind of latest iteration of that. But it's been given a different uh, dimension now um, by the fact that the UK is outside. So could there be an EEA 
um, which the UK would also be interested in helping the Balkans to move towards, or even the EEA itself. I'm curious to know what uh, people think about that. There's always reasons against, but is that something that could be done outside the accession process and which requires some kind of decision that the European Council's attention could be brought towards? Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, now getting to some of the questions in the in the chat, there was one uh, by Tina Perez on uh, um, the environmental protests in Serbia and uh, um, what they might portend, whether Serbia might go down uh, Romania's path. One from Bo O'Shea uh, on if the accession process is stalled, are we going to see the region drifting uh, towards uh, other powers um, and uh, what scenarios might be likely. I'm sure you all uh, you had the chance to read Dennis's uh, comment on, uh, uh, on Kosovo. Um, I don't have any more questions for the moment, so I'll go back to, uh, to the panel. Uh, would you like to go first again, Robert? Um, yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yes, if I'm, yes, if I'm here. Well, there are lots of questions. I, I'm sorry to say that um, uh, the loss of the UK, unfortunately, uh, really does make a difference here because <clears throat> the UK had this entirely misconceived idea that enlargement weakened the uh, European Union and was therefore a good thing. Um, actually, it never did. Um, every time a new member state joined, they brought a new problem with them and the commission got itself some new competencies. Uh, as the UK did itself when it joined, it invented regional policy as a, as a thing for the, uh, for the EU. So that was completely wrong, but nevertheless, I think it was a positive thing because I think that uh, EU enlargement has stabilized, uh, has helped stabilize Europe and it can, um, uh, and it is probably the best way of stabilizing the Balkans. Um, uh, and it's, I think, the only way that the EU is ever likely to be a geopolitical actor, because I don't want it to be. By the way, the, the term geopolitics was invented because people dislike talking about power politics, but that's what they mean. Um, I don't think that the EU is going to be a power political actor. I hope not. Um, uh, but it, it has, but its actual, its presence as a solid core of cooperative states um, uh, is a kind of European miracle. And extending that to the Balkans um, is, is simply the obvious thing to do. Um, uh, there's an article um, by uh, Rory Stewart in Foreign Affairs comparing intervention in Afghanistan and how much it cost um, with intervention in Bosnia and how little that cost. Um, and the reason was because there was political engagement in Bosnia. Um, uh, and it was not distant, it was a part of, a part of our, our world somehow, and it still is. Um, and all that needs to be done is to ratify that. Um, and it's really compared with other problems in foreign policy, like dealing with Russia and China, this is really easy. Um, and that all of those seem to me to be a good reason for doing it. Um, uh, and it's not difficult. Um, uh, people just need to make up their minds to do it. Then it could all be done very quickly and very easily. And if you've got a dynamic going, it could take you quite a long way. Uh, apart from that, um, uh, I agreed with everybody, everything everybody said, um, particularly actually, particularly what uh, Nicholas and Florian uh, said at the end. Um, so sorry to uh, be yeah, enigmatic. Thank you much. Um, Yes, I think one of the things Rory was mentioning in his article was also that the aims in Bosnia were very limited as opposed to Afghanistan, where they were always uh, undefined. So were perhaps uh, another uh, difference. But um, so Milica, do you want to, uh, to come in at this stage? Yeah, very briefly. Uh, I think uh, just to add to what Robert just said, I think the UK leaving does make uh, the enlargement process more difficult, uh, not only because it was traditionally a country supportive of the of enlargement, but also uh, UK being out, it's another comparator country outside the European Union. Therefore, Western Balkans countries are looking at yet another form of 
more or less intelligent life outside uh, of the European <laughs> Union. They, they listen to the discourse. Uh, uh, although whatever the British politicians say about the European Union is obviously not intended for the Western Balkans audience, it does reach the Western Balkans audience and it uh, solidifies some of the views. And they also uh, look at behavior and look at, for example, situations like vaccines, and they might think, oh, you know, being outside, look at you can be quicker, you can do some things. And, you know, it's just yet another model, uh, Norway, Switzerland, and now it's the European, uh, now it's the UK. So not only that you have uh, one less voice that would be uh, supportive of enlargement and uh, would be hefty in terms of uh, foreign policy and defense, but you also have another model outside which the Western Balkan countries, although nowhere near in terms of size and importance, will uh, internalize. So I would hope that the EU and the UK can actually cooperate uh, on Western Balkans because, you know, while it might not be the case everywhere in the world, I can't think of the UK and the EU having different goals in the Western Balkans. So this looks to me like a relatively easy and pain-free way to work together uh, yeah. and uh, uh, to achieve certain goals. Uh, second, there was a question uh, whether the region will drift towards uh, other powers if the accession process is stuck. I, I, I think what the region is currently experiencing is a Groundhog Day. Uh, it's where you know nothing really much changes and therefore they understand that the European Union is the rationally you know the biggest partner the choice and you know I remember when I was working for the Serbian government you would always ask them uh, who do you think it's the biggest friend of Serbia and invariably it would be Russia and they would always think that Russia is providing the biggest assistance now obviously they think that this is China but then they ask if you ask them where would you like to be operated and where would you like to move where would you like your children to go to school? The answer is not Russia. The answer is usually Germany. So uh, currently, uh, this basically people are still rationally understanding that this is the way forward. However, the European Union would need to communicate more clearly and to ensure that uh, uh, rhetoric and reality match a bit more uh, to continue, because I really think that there needs to be some level of emotional alignment with the organization for people to continue uh, mm. to support this uh, as a foreign policy mm. direction of the country. Mm. And finally, whether there would be a positive crisis, and uh, Tena, I think, also suggested whether these um, environmental protests... I don't know whether this would trigger a positive crisis. Would challenge certainly be a challenge for several uh, uh, for uh, government in Serbia. But what I would think it's important for the European Union to approach is to, to understand uh, what's causing those things and to approach it in a way so that uh, people in Serbia generally can align with it, uh, can continue to some extent emotionally aligning with the organization. Because I really think that uh, seeing a younger generation support the European Union less is partly caused but it's by its failure to communicate, but it is also partly caused by the feeling that it's not supporting what people in the region perceive as progressive causes. Thank you very much, Milica. Yeah, I hope that the EU and the UK can can work together on the Western Balkans. Um, yeah, I think the UK has appointed a, a sort of representative for uh, for Bosnia now, so that might be a sign of uh, of some degree of, uh, of wanting to engage. Um, but yes, now uh, Nikolaus, your final thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will I will stick to the comment on alternatives. I don't think that anyone really wants alternatives in the region. Any alternative to enlargement uh, will also be uh, a devastating uh, consequence for, the, for a promise that has been kept alive uh, during 20 years. And uh, somebody has to explain why we, pro we propose enlargement and instead of alternatives from day one. It can be any alternatives can be disastrous also for what we have so far. We should not take for granted the present stability. I take, for instance, the PRESPA agreement. The PRESPA agreement is premised on the EU accession of North Macedonia. If the EU accession of North Macedonia does not advance, the PESPA agreement will collapse. So much of what we consider now as an acquis 
might be in danger if there is no clear membership perspective. But also, it is not, alternatives are not realistic. Because how can you have a common market without a rule of law? So if you have a rule of law and you fulfill all these criteria, why you don't have membership? Is it just a problem with the members? Is it because we don't want them as members? Or is it because it is tougher to get members than to accede to the common market? This is something that should be cleared out. And also, these external actors do not propose an alternative. In many respects, they are, they are bidding on the EU accession of the region. Chinese investments in the region have come because the, EU, because the region has an EU perspective. The same goes for, uh, for investments uh, from, from the, the Gulf uh, states or even from Turkey. Even Russia might be, might, to some extent, might want the EU accession of the region to advance. I'm speaking EU and not NATO accession. And this is, in, some people in Moscow may think that they have more Trojan horses inside the EU and more countries to, to get, to get uh, weaker EU decision making in foreign policy. So EU enlargement is the only choice. It has been proposed for 20 years. And what we need is to get serious about it. At the same moment, as I said earlier in Florian too, EU enlargement cannot be uh, the solution to every problem. The, the policy of enlargement should be supplemented by other instruments, by negotiation with the use of sanctions and promises to resolve, pro to, to resolve outstanding problems in the region. Maybe the enlargement is not the remedy to the Serbia-Kosovo relations or to the Bosnia crisis. On its own, it is, it is part of the deal, it is part of, the, of a, the framework of negotiation, but cannot be the answer on its own. We tried it for a decade and we saw that it's not working. So the EU should come up with more instruments to supplement the enlargement uh, in order to, uh, to give the enlargement the place that it, that it had in the past. If I might just ask a, a very quick follow-up to that. You say that China invests in the region partly because it thinks it might join the single market. But would you say that Chinese investment actually in the long run might make that goal more difficult by entrenching corruption and uh, the way in which it, uh, it is often very untransparent, wouldn't you say it undercuts that goal? Well, there is a, there is a, 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 there is a, a paradox. On the one hand, uh, China tends to gain from the region EU accession because uh, its products will, uh, uh, because it's part of the EU market, because it has already a, play, a foot in it, because it has invested in this region. At the same moment, through its investments, and this is what Tena mentioned, uh, with a certain environmental impact, it is undermining the region's EU perspective. So China might have liked that the countries will accede to the EU as they are, are informed with this, with a, without uh, complying with EU norms. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me turn to you last, Florian. Thank you. Thanks, Luigi. I mean, I think, yes, to answer that question, I mean, to some degree, it's very difficult for the region to kind of fall into other spheres of influence outside the European Union. As we mentioned, I mean, it's the, it's not the backyard, it's the courtyard of Europe. It's uh, surrounded the citizens, uh, you know, uh, many of the citizens, in fact, are citizens of the European Union. There are lots of Bulgarian, lots of uh, Croatian, lots of uh, Hungarian citizens. Uh, people are moving uh, back and forth. So the movement already is happening. I mean, and, and so from that point of view, I don't see this kind of like complete absorption. Of course, there's a much stronger Chinese presence in Serbia, for example. But um, I think we have to be, also have to be clear that people are getting to be quite critical of this presence. I mean, in Montenegro, there has been the painful realization that the country is under a serious debt crisis because of the highway construction, which has been built with Chinese, uh, Chinese loans by Chinese companies for the most part. Um, in, in Serbia as well, people are quite, uh, quite, quite wary about, I mean, the protests now are against Rio Tinto, so not, not a Chinese or Russian, but a kind of Anglo-Australian multinational corporation, um, but but there have been also dissatisfaction with Chinese tire factory, which employed uh, Vietnam Vietnamese laborers in very dubious conditions. So people are seeing that you know these that, that those external actors are not just bringing love and affection, but they're also bringing you know serious problems to their countries, environmental problems, uh, labor uh, abuse, and so I think that that citizens uh, in the Western Balkans are not inherently enthusiastic about those investments and engagements. So, so I think what we might see is actually some more critical voices, uh, actually skepticism um, towards, towards that engagement. So I wouldn't assume that particularly. Um, but I think is, uh, certainly we see that authoritarian leaders 
uh, use these external actors to play them off once against the other. That's why China has been useful for Serbia. Now it can play between Russia, China, EU, Turkey, uh, and the Gulf. Um, and it, it increases you know, resources. And I think that's the you were asking. The problem is the, is the kind of intransparent deals which of course not just China and Russia do. I mean, Western companies do it as well. I mean, the, the Rio Tinto deal is intransparent uh, for citizens and dubious. Uh, the French promise to build a metro in Belgrade is also very intransparent. So it's of course, Western companies act in the same environment very similarly if there are no restraints. Um, and this is of course a, a problem, not just of external actors from the East. So I think we have to be aware of that. And that of course alienates citizens who feel like their, their government is, is, is maybe giving away or, 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 or destroying the environment. Um, so, so I think from that point of view, um, you know, the citizens still remain overall pro-European. I mean, this is where they see their future. And even if they don't say that in the attitudes, it's very clear in their, in their behavior. But I think one has to not take it for granted and assume that it's going to be like that. Um, and then the other point, the, you know, it came up again, the, the economic area, the EAA. I think the problem is doing anything alternative to EU integration will absorb a lot of capacity energy of political actors. And that means that energy will not be with EU integration. And that's a mistake. I think distraction uh, is, is, you know, we see also the region now we have the discussion of open Balkans, which has taken energy over the last year. And you really wonder all of the all of the possibilities for regional integration, economic cooperation existed previously to the open Balkans. It existed in CEFTA, which the countries of the region are part of. It existed in the RCC. So you get a sense, you get a new project every year or a couple of years where you can kind of promote and pump up. But then again, it mostly serves as a PR tool and delivers very little and then is, is eclipsed by another project. And that is, of course, the problem. It's very good from, a, from maybe from an advertising perspective, but very bad in terms of citizens' uh, benefits. So I think one has to be careful and not encouraging many more projects which will distract from the business at, at hand. Um, and so from that point of view, I think it's, 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 it's quite clear what the tools have to be and how they have to be sharpened, but I think they shouldn't be taken off the agenda or eclipsed or sidelined by anything else. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're at the end of our time. So I thought it's been a fascinating uh, discussion. Lots, uh, lots of, uh, of interesting uh, topics that came up. So thank you very much to our panelists for their time and their valuable insights. And thank you to our audience for asking such interesting questions. Goodbye, everyone.